We're live. I think so. Hold on. Are we live? Let me check on my phone to make sure. Okay. Oh, we are live. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm so excited uh, for y'all to join us today. Um, this is Ariana Brown. I don't know where I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Um, and Ariana and I, I guess, have been friends for about five years. Um, mm -hmm. Should we actually give it like two more minutes or a minute? Uh, yeah, maybe we should wait like another minute or so. You okay. know, people are never on time to poetry things. Mm -hmm. Even true, though. true. That's real. Let me see. On the time being, I guess, I can share, um, or do you have your books on you that you can hold up and just kind of tell them where to get them? I only have, I have my my chat book. Oh Lord, this is hard. Okay. This is my, this is my chat book, Sana Sana, that I released earlier this year. Um, and if you, I'm supposed to be on a book tour right now. Um, but I'm here on YouTube Live with everybody. So if you want a copy of this, you can go to arianabrown.com uh, and you can find a link to purchase this, um, which is the main way that I am paying for bills and food and all of that. I'm a touring artist. Um, so when you purchase this, it, it helps me just survive. Um, and if you like the poems in here, I also have them set to music on an EP that you can download and stream on my website as well, just arianabrown.com. Back to you, Alan. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and I guess for me, uh, I wrote To Love and Mourn in the Age of Displacement, which you can get from nomadicpress.com uh, and Intergalactic Travels, Poems from a Fugitive Alien, um, which is out with the operating system. They're not shipping books right now because it's based in Brooklyn, New York, in the epicenter of the pandemic. Um, but if you want to sign copy, um, I'll drop a link for Google Form and you can reserve them for me and I'll um, eventually <laughs> ship them out. But okay. So, oh my gosh, the YouTube live chat is popping. People are saying hello. Um, this is so exciting. We got 65 people watching. Oh my so it feels, like, it feels like a good time to start. Yeah. Um, so do you remember how we first met, Ariana? Um, like digitally? Yeah, digitally. <laughs> um, I feel like a long time ago, I think this is when you were still writing for, um, was it Everyday Feminism? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I had seen an, um, an article that you wrote um, and I was like, oh, I'm always looking for other black Mexican people. Um, and I think I sent you a friend request, friend request on Facebook. Uh, and I feel like from that point on, anytime you wrote about Afro-Latinidad or Afro-Mexicanidad, you would like tag me in the comments and share it on Facebook. Uh, but I don't, yeah, I didn't realize it had been five years though. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that we like, I have a different story of how we met. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> I love this, I love this. No, I think that's literally like the same time. Um, I think there was an article that was written and both of us were talked about in the article. No way. Do you remember that? With like, it was San Remezcla, I think. I was gonna say, was it a listicle? Like, like we are me too yeah. or something? Uh -huh. okay. So I think it was a listicle and it was interesting because it was um, like you, Sonia Guinanzaca, Sima Reyes, um, Elizabeth, um, and a few other folk. And it's just wild that, you know, five years later, here we are um, doing this live. Um, but I really love your work. And I have been teaching um, poems from Messy Girl, which is one of your chapbooks. Whenever I go to college campuses or high school, I bring this with me and it's my favorite poem here. I mean, I love the chapbook, but um, I teach I deserve all the time. Mm -hmm. And I have found it foundational um, as a piece of literature that gives, you know, um, framework of how to like talk about yourself to to young folk um so thank you for your work oh my gosh you're gonna make me cry <laughs> uh, <laughs> i feel like that means a lot to me too because uh i don't know messy girl is like a chapbook of poems that i p compiled uh years after writing them and i didn't think that they were i don't know I didn't think that they were like my best work or like poems that were gonna like change the face of poetry, which I don't know, really mattered to me for a long time. Uh, but the poems still feel like just really important to me as a person. So I don't know, that just, that means a lot to me. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the poem's definitely changing classrooms, so thank you. Yeah. And I love your yeah. work too. I feel like, I don't know, I feel like I learned a lot from you, from your scholarship and theory, as well as from your poems, which I feel like are all intertwined. So yeah, and I'm really excited to hear you read new work tonight. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'm excited for that too. But you too, because you um, finished an MFA program last year. Hello. You just released uh, Sana Sana, and you actually have another manuscript that you um, are going to be reading from today. So I'm excited mm -hmm. to hear that. And I think this is a good time to start. Okay. Are you ready? Am I ready? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to read the bio in your chapbook? Oh, Lord. Uh, sure. <laughs> Okay, so here is Ariana Brown's bio. Ariana Brown is a queer Black Mexican-American poet from the south side of San Antonio. She holds a BA in African Diaspora Studies and Mexican-American Studies, as well as an MFA in Poetry. Ariana is a recipient of two Academy of American Poet Prizes and the 2014 National Collegiate Poetry Slam Champion. An alum of Brave New Voices, Ariana's work has been featured in PBS, Huffington Post, for Harriet and Remezcla, dubbed a part-time curandera, Ariana has performed at venues across the US, including the San Antonio Guadalupe Theater, Harvard University, Michigan State University, Tucson Poetry Festival, and the San Francisco Opera Theater. When she is not on stage, she is probably eating an avocado, listening to Osuna, or validating Black Girl Rage in all its miraculous forms. Watch the music video for O2 Thrift Source on YouTube and follow Ariana on Twitter and Instagram at Ariana the Poet. Find free downloadable lesson plans for some of Ariana's poems at www.arianabrown.com. All right, so do you want me to keep the two of you or go to just you? Uh, this is this is cool right here, the way it is. I like, like being able to see you because it's just virtual and I don't hear anybody in the background. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. All right, so I'm here, do your thing, Boo. Thank you, Adlan. So I thought that I would start with poems from, well, the first poem I read is called Myself First, um, and it's in both my uh, online chapbook, Messy Girl, which is on my Patreon right now, um, as well as in my chapbook <laughs> that came out uh, in January, Sana Sana. So this is a really important poem to me. I thought I'd start with poems about like relationships and how, how one views the self and then move into uh, some other things. So this is myself first. The shame tells me not to tell you about the men who saw my softness or my blackness and called it an opening, but did not call me girlfriend. I did not know love only has one name, that anyone who comes to you wanting a mother or a distraction or a ride or die is a thief. What is misogyny but a parasite in a mirror, a liar in a lover's mouth? A man's voice licks my ear even when I'm alone, teaches me the angles I look worst in. I was born a black girl and I've been lonely ever since. My friend, who's not black, says he doesn't know how to deal with rejection because he's never wanted someone who didn't want him back. A privilege to be more than a skeleton with blood everyone can see to be allowed flesh and soul, to get to be whole. I wanna tell you that once I loved a black girl and it was miraculous when we were alone. In public, we avoided men, got asked a lot if we were sisters. Have you ever made a choice between truth and danger? Did you know for centuries, white men in brothels have paid to watch black women have sex with each other? Do you know how it feels to be gazed upon, to be looked at under the knife in a man's eye, to know strangers are raising their dicks and soiling your name while you try to make it home? There is no territory untouched by black women's blood. There is no lover I've had that I haven't also feared, except her. The shame was wearing my hands, when I threw my favorite CDs in the trash. Each girl-powered anthem chanted in pop songs reminded me how unsophisticated my interests are. The shame forbids dancing in public, hisses a reminder that men eat with their eyes and will feast whenever my body appears. The shame almost crawled up my throat and spoke to my ex-girlfriend before I choked and shoved it in the deep well of myself. I couldn't wield my tongue like an ax and say I loved her in the same breath. The first time I loved a black girl, I learned to love myself. I say girl, cause it's what we're not allowed to be, except around each other. I take back my shaved head, 
my hair uncurled and nappy, everything I prefer over someone else's image of me. I whisk my six-year-old self to a tender present, offer the grace I was denied, a gentle hand at the back of the neck, a lesson in commitment. Yesterday, I loved a black girl, and today, that girl is myself. Whenever I go missing, let me return here first. Let me choose myself first. Oh my gosh. Oh, I had to like turn my mic on again. <laughs> I appreciate Yo, that. <laughs> the comments are popping, so people are watching. Oh Just let you know. I cannot see the comments, so I have to like get on. Mm, so there'll be a little tab uh, where, because you're on the private chat, but there's also a comment. Oh my gosh. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, oh, all right. OK. Oh, wow. We've okay. got 116 people on here, so we're going to keep go the show going. Yeah. Oh, this is so cool. I feel so much better now that I can see people responding. Otherwise, it feels like I'm just shouting poems into the void. OK. <laughs> OK, I'm going to go on to this next poem. This is a little awkward. So I'm using two laptops to do this because that's how technology has been today. Um, the next poem I read is also from my chapbook, uh, Messy Girl. It's called Mercy. Okay. Let me tell you about lonely women and the earth. Let me tell you how important the moonlight is in my eye, how it sparkles on my walk home so I do not cry about the man from last year or curse my own vastness or wish to forget what I know of living, how I instead stop in the middle of an 11 p.m. residential street and sing something loud enough to kill me, to make a whole year of chase come halting in the air. Motown can do that. Remind a girl to notice the stars and give them something worth remembering. How God suspends the night with an alternative to breaking. How nothing weighs more than persistence, this old song. How all of this learning makes a moot point of silence and neighborly decency. For in all my temporary deaths, some angel of a song showed up, dressed in a ritual old as the sky and demanded the whole of me. For in all my trying, I have found a woman and this has been my most useful beginning. Let me tell you about hurting. Eventually, it ends. Uh, <laughs> so that's that poem. Those are all the poems I wanted to do about relationships. <laughs> um, mostly because uh, <laughs> I want to share work from this manuscript that I've been working on, which feels like, I don't know, I've been working on this manuscript for uh, probably about as long as you and I have known each other, Alan. Um, and yeah, I feel like every year I'm like, oh, the manuscript is done. And then I learn something else. And I'm like, oh, it's not done. I must go back and change a bunch of things. So I've been editing this for I don't know how long. It's still not done yet, but I feel like I've been sitting with them for so long that I want to get these poems out and see how they feel. Um, so some of these are still works in progress, but they feel really important to me. OK. So you know how I feel about Gloria Anzaldúa. Um, <laughs> Right now, the manuscript opens with a poem called At the End of the Borderlands, because um, I think we need more than, yeah. <laughs> OK, At the End of the Borderlands. <clears throat> we need new origins. Countries are killing everyone I love. For my cousin's lips, a wish for my safety. For my curandera's hands, rituals for healing. I simmered rosemary and drank its tea grew my hair thick as a plague, spoke poems till my throat blistered and waned and still could not curse colonizers enough to undo their work. No one I know has enough money to live, yet asks if I've eaten. Before day's end, we feed each other our blackness, grow full from offering our many tongues, studies, compassion, our wilderness and names. We run the length of country, reddening our feet, come to our own ends to face ourselves. What will we leave in our wake? Who we are now, our responsibility, 
our empty pockets, our humility or shame. Culture alone will not save us. Who are you without your nation? What would you give? Would you fight for those you don't love to whom you are indebted? Oh my, oh my, Ayana. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank Fuck. you. Mama. It feels good to also just read that poem out loud finally. Hi to all my people who are here. Thank you for showing up. Uh, this manuscript is a lot about. Um, yeah, thinking about experiences I had when I was younger, um, about being like the only black person in a Mexican American space. Um, and then I also lived and studied in Mexico City for six weeks in 2016. And so I also have poems that are sort of about how I was perceived and racialized there and what were, and why, right? Like what were the circumstances that allowed people to perceive me in one way or another? And what does that say about blackness? How Mexico perceives of blackness, uh, what does that reveal about its history? Um, this is a poem that's for my cousin, Micah. Um, it's called Negrita. Playing Loteria, I teach you to match word and picture and your eyes dry from the stare. We inhale the colors, winking back at us. They taunt, they will never give us a name like theirs. Your golden hand hovers a nervous onlooker, and I fear you offer your heart to this language, run your tongue along its teeth looking for light. I lean into your shoulder to stop the sun from leaking between us. You and I are not mirages, neither are our ghosts. To survive here, Miha, I work on the words, making a list of everything we are owed. That's the title of the manuscript right now is We Are Owed. Okay, this next poem, this next poem is called Field Notes. And this is moving into um, me moving through space in Mexico City. Um, shout out to my friend Sadie here in the chat who was with me on that study abroad program and made it bearable for me. Okay. So this poem has, um, this poem is written in couplets. Um, so there are little moments that are described in two, two lines each. Um, and in the center of the poem is text from a YouTube video um, called Heroes of Color, Gaspar Yanga. Um, and it, the, yeah, the text is all from, taken from that video, the historical information about Gaspar Yanga, while the other experiences are my own. Okay, field notes. As soon as I arrive in Mexico City, I am asked how long I have been growing my dreadlocks. My hair twisted up Havana style says nothing. I panic, mumble a while and avoid eye contact. Known as the first liberator of the Americas, Gaspar Yanga led one of the most successful slave rebellions in the Americas. Yanga was among the many slaves brought over from West Africa and forced into working the Spanish sugar plantations in Mexico. My host mom is a wealthy white Mexicana. She asks if she can take my picture because her children are hippies. Later, I tell her, mi papa is Afroamericano. She has never heard the word before. Should have said Mayate. Around 1570, he led a slave revolt and escaped with a group of followers into the mountainous terrain surrounding Veracruz. There, Yanga and his people formed a settlement which grew to some 550 people and eluded capture for nearly 30 years. My classmate says aloud, I didn't even know Afro-Mexicanos existed. Our professor nods, supportive. The white-skinned girls in my class complain about being called Wera. It's offensive to be named. I forgot to bring gel, so I scour the internet for a black beauty supply nearby. Can't find one in the entire city. Yanga and his people waged a campaign against, against Spanish colonial rule, raiding caravans that ran between Veracruz and Mexico City, carrying goods, foods, and other supplies. At the supermarket, I am asked, es tu cabello, for the first time in my grandparents' country. Welcome home. I've started counting the number of times I am mistaken for someone from another Latin American country. Yanga's raids 
and the ongoing exodus of black and indigenous slaves to his community upset the Spanish plantation owners. The owners called on the colonial government to take action. The vendor at the pyramids wants to know if I'm from Costa Rica. No, I'm your black neighbor, run. My professor, Wera, compares being called Wera to being called nigger and I'm the only one to correct her. In 1609, the Spanish governor sent a military force of 500 men to put an end to Yanga and his group. Opposing that force was Yanga's irregular army armed with firearms, machetes, bows and arrows, and even stones. The exhibit on racism Al Museo de la Ciudad de Mexico mentioned black people three times. The clerk at the gas station stared at my face, curious. He leaned across the counter and asked, es mexicana. When Yanga learned of the impending attack, he sent one of his Spanish prisoners to negotiate peace terms. The Spanish, however, had no interest in negotiation and a brutal battle quickly ensued. My host mom says, in Mexico, no hay black people. I point to myself, but she never looks me in the eyes. Es tu cabello real. Tienes mucho. Que increíble. Son rastas o trenzas. De donde es? Es de Africa. Both sides suffered heavy casualties, but the Spanish governor was forced to respect Yanga's strength. Yanga and his survivors retreated higher up into the mountains, out of Spanish reach, and again flourished. A video chat with my best friend. She asks about being black in Mexico, and when I cry, she does too. Every morning, I listen to Chance the Rapper's coloring book, hum to myself, we know, we know we got it. After many failed negotiations and military actions, the Spanish opted to negotiate in 1618. Under a treaty, Spain granted freedom to Yanga and his followers in exchange for an end to raid on Spanish caravans. One of my classmates from Oaxaca teaches me a phrase that means, I don't have to answer that. When a girl whines about Apple Music's Drake Bachata playlist, my friend says, black people invented bachata. In addition, the former slaves were given land and Yanga and his family were recognized as rulers of the community. By 1630, the town of San Lorenzo de los Negros was born, the first free African settlement in the Americas. Sometimes I forget how to say, how much does it cost? Wait while the vendor looks at me, blank. I went to the aquario and a puffer fish drifted toward me, stared joyously until I left. By 1932, the town was renamed Yanga to honor the courageous man who represented hope and liberty to so many enslaved people. I learned about Yanga during my final week in Mexico. Alone, finally, with my kin, I can't help but weep. I can't find an image of Yanga online. Instead, I try harder to love my own face, nose, lips, hair. I press my palm to the screen, then to my heart, promise to look for him everywhere, even in the quiet. Oh my goodness, ah, Ariana, Ariana, <laughs> this book is what I needed growing up. <laughs> Seriously, my gosh. Um, yo, I'm so happy that like, people are going to have this object in the near future. Oh my, I just like wanna cry, but I need to hold it together because I'm on camera. <laughs> you do not need to hold it together. I'm, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll let go, I'll let go. <laughs> okay, um, so I have a series of Yanga poems in the book, actually. I wanted to read um, one more from the series. It feels really important to me because I feel like um, there's one other figure um, Esteban Dorantes um, that I look at in the manuscript um, as, as Africans who were captured and enslaved, um, Yanga in Veracruz and Mexico City and Esteban um, brought, to, brought to the new world uh, and was one of the first person to map Texas. Um, and one of the things that feels really frustrating about going through the scholarship um, and looking at these kind of figures is that, um, first of all, there are no documents that they wrote themselves. So reading about them is always reading about them from the point of view of a Spaniard. Um, and in addition to that, there are no surviving images of what they look like. Um, and I feel like, I don't know, just again, that like loneliness 
or um, that desire to connect, but there being some huge barrier. Um, so that's a thing that comes up for me a couple of times. So this is a poem called, Why I Want to Know What Yanga Look Like. If I had a photograph of Yanga, if one arrived in the mail from a friendly but weary postman in a long thick envelope sealed with spit that was spat between the gap and two clean teeth, because I think of Yanga as having a gap between his teeth, not sure why, it just seems like it makes sense. Not a humongous gap, but a small one, a thin space between two yellow bones at the front of his mouth, the crack in a bell that makes the song sweeter. And when I speak about songs, I am always speaking about freedom. A gap like that, where everything goes black for a minute and then the lights come on and somehow what you are seeing is more beautiful because of the interruption, because the interruption becomes part of the thing itself. And suddenly you can't imagine the two teeth wide and high at the top of the mouth like sails, having ever existed without a dark spell in between them, marker of an absence, skinny black pillar, little room holding everything I have lost since Yanga's escape, since the sieges on land and by foot, the open door to four centuries of running and a fistful of secret languages I only speak in my dreams. If I looked at the photograph of Yanga and found all that, a litany of things thieved from my contemporary memory, and Yanga had sealed the envelope with spit and a lick of aloe vera, then I'd frame the photograph and hang it in the center of my home. So every time I left before locking the door, I'd check for Yanga, grinning at me with a gaze four centuries long black streak in his smile, the two large teeth shining like sugar. Hey, Frank. Uh, this is my partner's cat, Frank Ocean. Um, he is also featuring tonight. <laughs> hey, buddy. All right, I have uh, two more poems. Where did I put this one? Um, so this next poem, I'm trying out some things about vulnerability and in sharing work that is not completely finished or hasn't been proofread. Um, so this is the only poem in the manuscript that's entirely in Spanish. Um, it's called Alternate Names for Pelo Malo. Um, it's after Dennis Smith's poem, Alternate Names for Black Boys. If Frank will let me read this. <laughs> um, so a lot of these, one, I felt like I needed alternate, alternate names for um, like just ways to refer to my hair. I found um, when I did encounter other Afro-Mexicanas in Mexico City, they were always asking me about my hair. Uh, I had Havana twists and they had never seen that before. And so they wanted to know how to get it done and where to go. And I felt myself at such a loss because I had never, um, really been around other black people that spoke Spanish. And so I had no vocabulary to talk about black hair in Spanish. I had all these words in English. So I didn't even know how to say cornrow or twist, um, just really basic words. So I was like, I need a list <laughs> of words. Um, but then also I wanted to um, sort of thinking about um, Dina Smith's poem, Alternate Names for Black Boys, about other ways to describe um, black hair. So I have no idea if these descriptions uh, sound good <laughs> or not. Uh, my friend Itzel helped me translate this and she's also a poet, um, shout out to Itzel. Um, so yeah, we're trying this out to see how it feels. So this is, um, I'm gonna read the, uh, a lot of uh, Afro Latinx folks on Twitter helped me with these words also. So I'm gonna start by reading um, just the literal definitions of like how to say basic things. Um, and then I'll go into like the figurative um, descriptions. Okay. Hi, Enrique. Okay. Alternate names for pelo malo. Ondas, trenzas pegadas, pelo cuco, cereta, engarocolado, raratonga, colochos, puchunco, pelo vivo, bailarines del mar, planteado en el cuero cabelludo, Tonada baja, como de la boca del pájaro, vencedora del peine, lazo engominado con aceite, nuba de espacia, protectora que necesita protección, arquitectura de lana, 
y la transformadora original. So that's that poem. Okay, uh, last poem. This poem comes toward the end of the manuscript um, and it's called Introductions. I'm Ariana and I've been conquered. Child of Mexico, Africa, USA. I have someone else's name. I was born in a cemetery. In 1848, Frederick Douglass wrote an article condemning the US conquest of Mexico. I went to the Alamo on a field trip once. My uncle's dream is to own land. His Facebook photo is him atop a horse. This is not a joke. A border blew through me, hooked my great grandmother's tooth, dragged the bones of Laredo south across the river. My great grandmother's is a My great grandmother's country had a black president in 1829, last name Guerrero, meaning warlike, soldier. My father was in the Air Force. He died flying. Try to tell me the wind don't speak. My father died before I was born. I talk to everyone's ancestors. I'm a cotton twirler, shapeshifter, grave digger. My curandera says the earth can transform anything. I be burying shit all the time. Thank you. There was a little glitch halfway through. We lost you for like two seconds, but you came back. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I'm back. Ah, okay. So tell us more about this manuscript. Um, what is your, your dream for it? Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to finish it, Alan. I just want to finish it and feel like, yeah, because I feel like, okay, when I started this manuscript, I was very indoctrinated into Mexican American studies. And so it was, it was just bad. It was a real bad time <laughs> in the manuscript. Um, <laughs> and I feel like um, I have learned a lot um, since beginning this manuscript for freaking, I don't know, five years, three, four or five years ago. Um, and so I'm trying to make sure that um, the poems represent me politically, um, that mm. I feel like they are fully fleshed out. So it's, I, I feel like it's okay if I feel like the poems are not as tight as I wanted them to be. I just want my politics to be clear. I want it to be clear what I stand for and who I stand with. Um, and so I find myself still needing to go back because um, some of the poems are important to me, but that doesn't mean they have to be shared or like important, be important to other people. So I'm trying to go back and like edit. So I just want to finish this thing finally um, and then find some way to put it out in the world do lots of readings like this one yeah i'm so excited you know like once it's done send it over <laughs> i will yeah i just i feel like there's some poems in there right now that if you read them you'd be like ew <laughs> why did you write that so <laughs> no they're a little cringy i feel like so i'm trying to figure them out <laughs> okay okay well yeah. i got you i got you i appreciate that <laughs> do i have to uh, read your bio now is that what's happening um you don't have to, like, you can read part of it. <laughs> okay. Um, is it in your chapbook, your bio? Uh, either, yeah, there's a bio, I think, at the end. At the end, okay. Not on the back. I see. Okay, you said part of it? Yeah, just whatever. Okay, just a little bit. Okay. Is everybody ready? because you're about to have a, a wonderful time. You're about to be blessed um, from one of my favorite artists creating work today in the world. <laughs> All right, here we go. The official reading of the bio of Alan Palaez Lopez, who is an Afro-Indigenous poet, collage, and adornment artist from Oaxaca, Mexico. Their poetry has been nominated for so many amazing things. They have been awarded residencies and fellowships from amazing places. Um, and recently they are the author of To Love and Mourn in the Age of Displacement, available through Nomadic Press, which is an amazing, incredible, thoughtful, tender chat book um, that I blurbed because I believe in it and you should too. Uh, they also have a full length called um, Intergalactic Travels, Poems from a Fugitive Alien, which is amazing, incredible, and should be studied everywhere. 
Um, so without further ado, please give it up from uh, drum roll, lots of uh, stomping, clapping, cheering, wooing from <laughs> your living rooms and wherever you are for Alan Velayas Lopez. Oh, thank you, Vu. Um, oh, I'm so excited. So um, because this is like an Afro-Mexican poetics reading, I guess, um, I will just read like the epigraph of how my book starts and then I'll go into other poems. So when you open my book, the first thing in the book um, is a map um, of Oaxaca. And on top of the map, I'll read what it says. In the 16th century, New Spain, as Mexico was then called, probably had more enslaved Africans than any other colony in the Western Hemisphere. Blacks were present as slaves of the Spaniards as early as the 1520s. Um, and right underneath that quote, it's um, a map of Mystic and Zapotec territory. Um, I grew up in Mystic territory. Uh, my mother and grandmother were born in uh, Zapotec territory. Um, and the chapel kind of just traces what it's like to be undocumented, Black, Indigenous, queer in the US. Um, and I'm going to read one poem from here, and then I'll move on to other work. And this poem is called Discovering Blackness. Only if I can find it. OK. I am nine years old, and Mama Maria tells me que somos negros. I do not believe her. We have only been in this country for four years. And one thing I know is that only Americans can be black and only Americans can be white. Y yo, ¿cómo puedo ser negro? No hablo inglés, no tengo papeles, mierda, no soy americano. Mama Maria me dice que somos negros. Mama tells me that I must learn to love my skin, my piel, to love my accent, my acento, to love my culture, my cultura. I do not understand. One year later, bilingual education ends. I am shipped to a school 13 miles away. I am labeled Haitian. I am yelled at in French Creole by an ESL teacher to whom I am her only student. I do not understand. Ce garçon est très stupide, she whispers to another teacher. I do not understand. 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 I do not. That night, I cry in the bathroom until Mama Maria comes home from cleaning houses. I tell her I hate my new school. I hate the way Mademoiselle looks at me. I hate the way kids pull my hair. I hate being the only immigrant, el único ilegal. I can see the water in Mama's eyes. Somos negros, Mama Maria tells me. Pero no les puedes decir a nadie de dónde somos, porque nos deportarán. Y si nos deportan en México por ser negros, nos van a matar. Ah, yo, growing up, um, a black kid from Mexico in the US is a trip. <laughs> and I think that. Took me a, over 10 years to find another person who was black and had grown up um, in the US. Um, and then I met Ariana and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you understand. <laughs> oh, so this reading is a dream, because uh, who would have thought, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, uh, per Ariana's request, before our life, I'm going to read a poem from To Love and Mourn in the Age of Displacement. Um, and this poem is called 18 Notes on Love. I'm ready. And, li and literally, these were actually notes on my cell phone that I was like, I think they're a poem. Let me put all 18 together. Yes, I can't snap, but this is me snapping. <laughs> <laughs> all right, 18 Notes on Love. One, I walk behind him, study his pace, check if his arms swing to the beat of his step and scurry to catch up. I remind myself, yes, our love may not be safe, but black and indigenous liberation requires risk. Two, we will walk next to each other, close. On the perfect day, the tops of our hands will fill each other's warmth. A new world will begin building. Three, and we will pretend not to notice. There is a lot of pretending not to here. Four, we will walk 
and laugh. Five, at bars we pretend there is no trauma. Six, sometimes we kiss, a peck most likely, or a longer kiss, but only when we can assure that the traffic lights will be our only witnesses. Seven, we're gonna hate crime, one will joke as queers of color usually do. Eight, we will sin and we will continue to do so often. Nine, hands will slip underneath t-shirts, flesh will meet, devour, offer flesh. 10, one of us will open our eyes as we kiss and the world that started to form will beget new forms of care. 11, we will stand outside, breathing hard or hardly breathing as we examine each centimeter of pupil. 12, the optometrist says that the pupil determines how much light will enter the eye and this moonlight is mischievous. Why does she insist in having us enter into each other's eyes? 13. After a thorough eye exam, his right hand will delicately move my locks away from my glasses and ask, 14. Is it okay if we hold hands all the way tonight? 15. We will hold on to dear life. 16. Heteros will brand us as radical but in a forever era of anti-blackness, femicides, and other settler violences, let's be precise and call it living the only way we've known how, as black, queer, Indian, and for the first time, together. 17, our future is not guaranteed here. 18, and for this reason, we create abundance where we thought there was none. Greatest poem ever. <laughs> Thank you, yo. I feel like I am um, a magic all falling for, you know, people that don't know how to hold, but you know, sometimes they do and those moments last for like five minutes or a week and those five minutes in that week is fantastic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Speak your truth. Yeah, yo, two days ago, I found this like Instagram account. I can't remember the name right now. I followed mm -hmm. them, but it's an account that all the jokes are about, um, like and trying to like get married for papers or falling like, um, for other undocumented people who are trash. Uh, and I was just like, oh my gosh, this Instagram account really gets me. I was gonna say, is this your life? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Okay, so I'm gonna read new work. Um, We're so this lucky. is interesting. <laughs> so I'm working on a choreo poem, uh, which is a full length book, a full length play, a full length poetry collection. And uh, the choreo poem was developed by Antosaki Shange. Uh, she's now an ancestor. And it's um, a full length poem um, that incorporates music, dance, uh, stage directions, different voices. And uh, this is written for the stage. There are stage directions. I'm going to read the first scene of the choreo poem, and it's titled uh, Chambales, Libelulas, Dragonflies. Chambale is what we call dragonflies um, in the pueblo that I grew up in, Oaxaca. And um, Chambales, uh, my mom used to play with them as a child. She used to tie a little string around them and pretend they were pets on leashes. Um, uh, they're also eaten, they're roasted and eaten um, in tacos, uh, in salsas, um, in playudas. Um, and I'm just gonna read this and there's stage directions. There's two characters. Uh, so we'll see what you think. <clears throat> this is the opening scene, by the way. Reader. Please take a seat on four adobe bricks arranged in a square. Another nightmare? See, abuela, when I close my eyes, I feel pressure on my neck. It hurts, abuela. It's real. It's like ants walking all over my neck to my fingers. Sometimes it's harder than ants. It's like someone is throwing sabotes at me. Hmm. Abuela hands toddler a piece of wax, picks toddler up, and asks the toddler to place the wax onto a small frying pan. Abuela lights a match, throws it under the pan, and naked corn cups begin to burn. 
As the wax is melting, Abuela grabs a piece of the corn tortillas that she made 15 minutes prior, dips her fingers in a clay bowl, splashes some water on one face of the tortilla, shakes salt on the water face, and hands it to the toddler to nibble. We're going to let the wax cool, and when it's not hot anymore, you have to pick it up and hand it to me. After, we'll be able to see what's bothering you. Toddler spots a yellow dragonfly hovering over a pile of fallen sapotes and begins to smile at the beautiful shine of the insect as the sun ray hits the dragonfly's abdomen. Chismoso, I thought you said you had a nightmare. See, si, abuela, I was just laughing at that thing that flies. What thing? Ay, abuela, es cosa, ya sabes. Cállate, the wax is cold. Remember, you have to pick it up and hand it to me. In a village named after a Roman Catholic Mexican priest lives a most powerful curandera. Her name is Belém. Her children are everywhere and nowhere at all. In a village named after a Roman Catholic Mexican priest lives a most powerful curandera. Gossiping medicine men refuse to honor her gifts. Bruja, they called her. In a village named after a Roman Catholic Mexican priest lives a most powerful curandera. Her name is Belém, and she is the child of a murdered indigenous rebel and an unnamed negra. In a village on the Pacific coast of Oaxaca, Mexico, lives the Zapotec's best kept secret. Toddler picks up the piece of ardent wax that took the shape of a small frying pan and hands it to Abuela. Do you remember your dream, hijo? No, Abuela. How many dreams did you have? I don't know, Abuela. Do you remember dreaming of kids? See, si, abuela, like me. Abuela observes the wax, notices she is getting dizzy, looks down and finds two adobe bricks on top of each other and sits. Abuela reads the five dreams in her head before she says anything to the toddler. Waves smack the body. Nayeli, seven, drowning. Spring, crossing season. Summer indicates the migration will be safe. Jesh Susan, Three sprints. In that Jani, one knows to crawl under the fence. She was trained all fall. At 4 a.m., Yao, 12, is sewn inside car seat. Winter will protect. Itzel, five, plains dead. Border patrol agents see her body. They leave. Body from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, definition one, the physical whole of a life, a dead person or animal. Body, from Urban Dictionary, top definition, to murder someone. In both, the body is always already close to death. Where is the indigenous body in a settled territory? Where is the black body in a settled territory? Where is the indigenous body in a settled territory? Where is the black body in a settled territory? Where is the indigenous body in a settled territory? Where is the black body in a settled territory? Is it buried under a papaya tree? Does each seed represent a nation? Does it taste good when you consume it? Chew on the seeds and spit them out? Does it shape shift into insects? Do you chase the insect and spray it with repellent? Where is the body in a settled territory? Where is the body in a settled territory? Where is the body in a settled territory? Settlement to disembody, dispossess, deterritorialize, deindigenize. Mijo. Listen to me carefully. Something is going to happen. I think something is already happening. Those dreams you're having are of real people. Amor, no le temas a tus sueños. Abuela, I'm scared. Toddler begins to get teary-eyed. Mijo, no pasa nada. I love you. Abuela, what's going to happen? I'm not sure, mijo. Just know this. Whatever happens, I will always be there. All you have to do is whisper to the water, talk to the water. When the dragonflies visit the water, they will take your messages and pass them to each dragonfly until I receive your words. I promise I will be listening. I will also be sending you messages. Toddler stares in confusion, only half listening. Abuela, I'm hungry. Abuela walks to a drying papaya tree, examines the weak branches, closes her eyes, and whispers something only the branch could have heard. Abuela opens her eyes and gently cuts the decaying branch with the machete resting against the fence. 
Abuela walks away from the branch and heads to a fire pit she made the summer prior over a hand-sculpted clay oven. Abuela cuts the branches and begins to light them with a match. Bring me the snake skin tea, mijo. Toddler runs for the tea. Gracias, precioso. I'll make you tea while I cut and build nopalitos. Está listo. Come drink. Gracias, abuela. Abuela walks over to the tallest star-shaped star cactus plant in her garden. Again, closes her eyes, whispers, and with a small knife, cuts about nine inches from the plant. As she's walking to find a pot to fill with water and cactus, she notices that the toddler has fallen asleep. Abuela walks to the toddler, squats down, gives two, four, two kisses on the forehead and whispers in the toddler's ear. Mi amor, you're going to have to learn how to run. Learn to run without shoes. Forget what it feels like to tie laces. Do not practice the ritual of a bow too many times. For you, you will forget that you are in danger. Corazoncito, when you get to the fence, you must run. You must not look back. You must run faster than ever. Pretend you are back in the pueblo and you have just the bean of coffee from the no heart men that enslaved our ancestors. Run as if they have seen you. Run to safety before they hunt you like a deer. Run before they lasso your body, traffic you to America, imprison you in detention, lynch you at the White House. Corre. Mijo. The life you must save is your own. You have thousands of hearts beating through your blood system. You may feel alone, but you are not. Deep inside your flesh, there are spirits of Zapotec African warriors. You will fight all the way. You will take in every ray of sunlight. You will take in any bit of water offered and you will always burst new roots. You cannot be killed. Life is not only in your body. It is in your words, in your dreams, in your gestures, in your family, in your land. And this land will be here, even if that means waiting. The land is patient. So that's the first scene of the play that I'm writing. Um, thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh, I like, I need a minute. Do you need a minute? How do you feel after reading that? Yeah, I'm like, crap. <laughs> Is this your first time reading this scene aloud? Um, I performed like half of this scene combined with half of another scene once. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't in my body for 15 days. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it feels good to read this play out loud and be like, oh yeah, it's happening. I'm writing a play. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Um... Yeah, I had such an emotional reaction to that. Um, thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, thank you, thank you. Um, so I guess now are we taking questions or are we asking each other questions? <laughs> yeah, do you, <laughs> uh, yeah, we can take questions from each other and from uh, for everyone listening, if y'all have any questions or thoughts you wanna share um, based on the work we've shared or yeah, however you're feeling. Um, yeah, can I ask you a question about this play? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just the same question you had for me about my manuscript. What is your dream for this play? You know, um, I wish that I was writing this in Spanish. Um, it's in Spanish right now, but my dream is that somebody will help me translate it. And I really wanna just, pick up my shit and move to Oaxaca and produce this play in Oaxaca. Yeah. <laughs> that is like the dream. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but for you, um, one of the things that I'm really interested in the poems that you read is you're, you're really um, resurrecting this archive that everybody assumes doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And you're imagining what, um, ancestors looked like, uh, how they moved through the world, what they thought, um, how they smiled. Like, right, you have that poem, you're talking about um, the gap in the tooth. You're not just imagining their existence, but you're literally imagining their every day, their gestures, like, like a full life that is, uh, as far as Mexico is concerned, Mexico can't even phantom it, right? So it's like, 
I don't know how you have felt when you've been to Mexico, but the last time that I went to Mexico, um, they thought that my Mexican passport was fake. Um, and they just couldn't believe that I was born in Mexico. And it was just this trippy thing where I was like, who would, first of all, who would fake a Mexican passport? <laughs> It's not like things are <laughs> phenomenal right now. <laughs> um, and that wasn't long ago that I was there. So mm. you're literally writing this, this, this object, um, this historical document that the state doesn't believe exists that will be like, oh, that's not real. How does that feel for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, it feels really, it feels really important. Um, I think especially because, um, so shout out again to my friend Sadie, who's in the chat, who was on that um, study abroad in the FA with me. Um, she's the one who shared that um, that Yanga YouTube video and literally was the only, I feel like the most information about Yanga in like the most concise way, but the most information about him in English that I could find anywhere was this one like three minute YouTube video um, <clears throat> that I could find, right? Everything, every other document I found was in Spanish. Um, and in like colonial Spanish, right? So like for me, very hard to decipher. Um, it took a lot longer, right? And there wasn't as much information, right? And it was again, written by a Spaniard. So um, when I saw that video of Yanga, I was working on my um, presentation that I was giving for the class I was taking while I was there, um, which was about me presenting field notes about how I had been received in all these different spaces in and around the FA. Um, and yeah, whether or not people perceived me as Mexican based on how they interpreted my Spanish fluency and who I was with. Um, and so uh, when I saw that video, I felt like for, for the whole six weeks, I had only seen, I think, three other Black people um, and they had all spoken to me, right? Like we know each other when we see each other, right? Um, even if we couldn't communicate well, um, and so when I saw that video, I felt like, okay, I'm not alone, that there is another Black person at some point who has been moving through these same spaces that I have been in um, and know something about how to survive here. Um, mm -hmm. And that felt really important to know that, like, that I wasn't the first person to do this or to exist in a space. Um, and <laughs> LOL, Sadie's comment in the chat. <laughs> It was a lot of trauma. <laughs> there were some things going on. Um, but I think because of that, it felt, um, it, because I'm not alone, it means I have a relationship to these people that have moved through these spaces too, right? And so if I know something about them, it's now my responsibility to tell that thing. Um, yeah, so I'm also trying to figure out how, how, how do I, maintain a responsibility to these uh, people because they're not abstract historical figures. They were people, they were living people. Um, yeah. Right, oh my gosh, thank you for that. That makes, I mean, it's hard work. Um, you know, my first time like finding black Mexicans in an archive, I went to, um, there's this museum in Oakland and it's called African American Museum and Library. Mm -hmm. And they have an archive selection. And I once went there, I was looking at the Panther paper. And then I randomly just asked them, I was like, oh, do you have anything on black Mexicans? And then they were like, actually, we have a folder on black Mexicans. And like, they give me this manila folder. And literally, it's literally a manila folder with like five pieces of paper inside. <laughs> <laughs> and they're literally printed pieces of paper from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so you have like, you know they exist. Like Google search results, like what? <laughs> yeah, and, but I was like, whoever created that archive must have been like, this is important, and it's a form of like resistance and disruption, right? In the in the archive, at least. Yeah. Um, but it's wild that in a museum space, printed things from the internet are worth archiving because that is how little people know about Black Mexicans. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, oh, we have a few questions in the chat. So let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, so KB asks, um, have your artistic practices been, how have your artistic practices been during social distancing? How are you both being gentle with yourselves, reflecting the times in the work, if applicable? 
Do you want to take that question first, Alan? Um, I guess, so the first couple of weeks of uh, social distancing, I couldn't do anything. I was, I was sitting at my computer and I would try to just write and I couldn't. Um, and eventually, like I had this poem in my mind for um, a couple of months. Um, and then one day after eating dinner, I like sat in my computer and kind of like just wrote it, but I didn't intent to write it. I was just like, let me see if something comes out. Uh, I'm like looking for it because it was on my desk a second ago. Um, but yeah, I haven't been that productive. Um, this week I've been a little bit more productive, but this just, that's just because I have better food. <laughs> <laughs> that's real. I have like fresher vegetables and fresher fruits because I did like mega groceries last week. Um, and that's helped me stay um, in my body. Yeah. What about you, Ariana? Um, yeah, same. I feel like I, <laughs> I think I said this when we were on the phone uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was like, I, I lack any urgency to do anything whatsoever. <laughs> um, this is generally how I feel. Um, I, the only thing that's been keeping me like on track is that I'm still, um, I'm a part-time grad student right now. So every like week I actually have, um, assignments that I do every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So that gives me like some kind of structure. Um, and then I have uh, features this week and next. So I'm like, oh, I should prepare. I have to make a set list, you know? So that's like a task to, to do. Um, I have written one thing since uh, all of this uh, wildness started um, that for me is, is a, uh, it's like a list of ways uh, for me personally to be responsible um, during COVID-19. Um, so, uh, not ordering anything that I don't need to order, um, try figuring out ways to like support local businesses that are asking for support, but not patronize places that are um, being harmful to their workers. Um, Cause I feel like I would like a list of instructions from somewhere from somebody to make sure I'm being responsible to other people. Um, but I haven't seen one. So I was like, let me make one uh, in the best way that I know how, and then I can talk to other people about it. So I don't know if it's a poem yet. It's just a lot of thoughts, um, but yeah, that's all I have right now. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm like still looking for this poem because I just want to show you. Is it a concrete poem? Is it doing things on the page? Oh my gosh, I think it is um, the most involved concrete poem I've written. Um, I'll send it to you at some point. Um, so concrete poem is any poem that are written in the shape of the object or essence that the poem is about. And I'm a visual poet. Um, so most of my work is like concrete. Um, but yeah. Do you um, want to pick one of the questions? Sure. So the next question I see is from Alejandro Graciano. Um, who I think is the, um, I think we were messaging on Instagram earlier about, uh, about coming, uh, yeah, about this uh, YouTube live thing. Um, and so um, I can start with uh, answering this question and then we can jump to you, Alan, mm -hmm. that's cool. Um, so I grew up um, on the south side of San Antonio, Texas, which is a predominantly non-Black Mexican-American space. Um, and I also, um, my father was, a, was an African-American man, uh, but he passed a couple of months before I was born. And so I was born into a home uh, where there were no other black people. It was myself and my mom who was mestiza. And she's a brown mestiza Mexican American. Um, and so for a long time, I was the only black person in my house, my school, my neighborhood. Um, and because I'm not dark skin uh, and I have um, a kinky curly hair texture, that was the most visible thing about me. So my hair was an immediate marker of blackness. Um, and so in that space in the south side of San Antonio, I was not um, ambiguous. Everyone I came into contact with knew I was black. Um, and I was the only, because I was the only black person, I was also hyper visible. So I was very aware um, that I was black um, from like a very young age. Um, it was called like the N-word in at, at school, at daycare, people would stick pencils and erasers in my hair because they didn't fall, right? And they thought that was really funny. So they would laugh and make fun of me in Spanish. Um, so those were things I always knew. So that was never really a question uh, for me. I always knew that um, 
the world interacted with me as a black person before they interacted with me as anything else. Um, so I feel like that's been a big part of my, how I see myself um, because that's what, and I feel like that's how racialization works, right? Like you don't decide, <laughs> other people decide what you are in the wherever, wherever you are. Um, and then you have to sort of respond to that. Oh, uh, I think, I mean, parallel experiences, um, like as far as like people sticking pencils in my hair, that, that happened to me too in grade school. Um, I, that. I don't know, but I hear a lot from people like in general, um, especially people with froze. Uh, mm -hmm. Young people can be little devils. Um, mm -hmm. And I realized that I was like in the US um, when I was put in like, the school that I went to literally hired um, a French Creole speaking ESL teacher because they thought that I was Haitian. And I didn't tell them that I was Mexican because I was like, if I tell them they're going to deport us. <laughs> um, but I guess I should have found that I was Mexican because I remember um, in kindergarten in Mexico City, um, we were doing this, like, there was this lesson happening and the teacher was showing us um, photographs. And I just, I vividly remember this. Uh, this is one of my few memories from school in Mexico. And she got a photograph of a monkey and then she said that it looked like me. And I just started crying. Um, and I never really knew why I, I was crying. I just felt like attacked because the kids were crying. Um, and it wasn't until I was in high school um, that I remembered that. And I was like, holy crap. That was my first experience of being racialized as Black uh, through like a stereotype in North America. Um, and that was in Mexico. That was my freaking kindergarten teacher in Mexico City. Um, and I guess, she knew I was black. I didn't know I was black, but I knew a few years later in the U.S. You know, I feel like um, <laughs> real quick with that question. Uh, yeah, you said you knew you were black real quick in the U.S. I think it wasn't my mom, but it was my it was my aunt, um, my dad's side of the family, my aunt LaRonda, um, who's a dark skinned black woman. Um, and I remember when I was young uh, telling her uh, telling her that kids at school in San Antonio, right? The kids at school, um, that it wasn't my, it wasn't my skin color that, um, made me face discrimination. It was my hair. Um, and my Loranda is African-American, right? And she looked at me for a second and she was like, Ariana. <laughs> and I was like, yes. <laughs> and she was like, um, and her context, right, is a U.S. Southern context, right? She lives, she lives and is from Houston. Um, so she was like, baby, you look like a light-skinned black girl wherever you go. And, and, but I think she meant in her context, right, in the U.S. Um, and that's sort of how I've been racialized everywhere in the U.S. But yeah, I think it's interesting you mentioning, like, there's something about blackness in the U.S. Um, that I feel like um, is immediately I don't even know if it's like immediately visible, right? Cause you and I look the same when we're in the US versus when we're in Mexico. But I found when I was in Mexico city that there was this like willingness to suspend disbelief. So people wanted to believe that I was anything else other than black, because if I was black in Mexico city, that meant that other black people were also in Mexico city. And that wasn't something they wanted to believe about Mexico, right? That black people walk among us. So I had to be from Costa Rica or I had to be from Puerto Rico or I had to be from Honduras, but anywhere but Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> this is so layered. <laughs> okay, oh, wow, there's like quite a few questions coming in. Um, okay, okay. Okay. Are there any ones that, you're, that you particularly want to address, Ariana? Mm -mm -mm -mm. I'm interested in uh, yeah, well, let me ask you because I, I feel like I took the last question, so what questions are you no, interested in? you you pay it okay yeah, all right <laughs> um I'm down for uh Simone Campbell's question <clears throat> do you see that one yeah mm -hmm. um. <clears throat> So I think, yeah, experiencing displacement in communities that are supposed to love you belong. how do you balance in between feeling? Um, I feel like this is something I struggled with a lot uh, as a teenager um, <clears throat> about figuring out how to define myself and like, who are my people? 
Um, I feel like it wasn't until high school um, I realized that I was always gonna have a home among black folks, that that was gonna be a space where um, I was not only accepted, but loved uh, unconditionally. Um, and there were, I feel like moments when, uh, yeah, just like when you're around people who have never been around people of another culture, right? Just moments where you have to have conversations about understanding, you know, or just respecting certain things. But for the most part, I feel like um, black folks have always been a home for me. Uh, and once I realized that it became a lot easier <laughs> to be myself and also to be in community with other, yeah, with other people. So I feel like that in between feeling kind of went away once I realized that I always feel comfortable around, around black, fo black folks that love black folks. <laughs> yeah, what about you? Yeah, um, I mean, for me, like, <laughs> community is such a tricky word. Um, mm -hmm. Cause it's like, you know, like, I think the, the most, the hardest situation I've ever been in um, was a situation that I had no idea how to deal with the, at the moment that it happened. Um, and then like a few days later, I posted publicly on social media about it. Um, but I had been invited into like, um, like an indigenous space. It was particularly like a, Oaxacan predominantly space and there were like comments that were heavily like they were understood as microaggressions by everybody but I was the only black person in this space mm -hmm. and I speak both languages and I very much understood exactly how they meant to say what they were saying um, and I was like wow I'm in a space with primarily people from Oaxaca and these are the comments that are being made I thought I was gonna, for the first time in my life, be going into a space where I was gonna be like embraced and like uplifted. And I was like, fuck. Mm -hmm. um, and it took me a while to figure out how to address that. And um, part of it was me saying, actually like, just because we share a culture doesn't mean that like, we're gonna be able to know how to hold each other. Um, and it didn't, I didn't let myself dismiss it or be like, oh, they're oppressed and therefore they're oppressing me. It was more of like, next time that I'm with people, I need to actually be like, hold them accountable and be like, I'm hurt because of this. But at that moment I bit my tongue because I just, it was the first time I was ever in space and I had no idea how to move. Um, balancing the in-between is now is about, if I feel like I, it's taking a toll for me to be there. I just leave spaces. I'm okay with leaving spaces. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel that. That was, Yeah, that was a good question. You wanna pick a question next? Sure, sure, sure. Um, let's see. Mm. Oh, I like this. Uh, what are your major influences in terms of authors and texts for your writing, academically and not academically, or just in general, because they tend to overlap? Okay, so, for the, the play that I was writing, I mean, Antasaki Shange is definitely who I'm, like who my work is after in that play. Let me just show you some of her books because I have a really cute bookshelf. Well, I just have so many books, uh, but um, this is one of like her phenomenal books. Um, this is my favorite book of hers. <gasps> Are you serious? <laughs> okay. I love to hear it, love to hear it. Oh my gosh, I literally just was reading her essay collection yesterday. Um, it's called on, on Language and Sound, something like that. It's somewhere. Anyway, so and Lost in Yes, Lost in Language and Sound. Uh, I also love, I mean, Andres Lord's work is phenomenal. I consider myself an essayist. June Jordan's essays are mm -hmm. something that I literally, every time I give a keynote or if I'm supposed to uh, write an essay, I literally reread a whole bunch of her essays and then kind of use some of her structures to organize my speaking engagements around. Um, and as far as poets, um, Jennifer Tamayo is one of my favorite poets, um, an experimental poet. Um, I really have been, oh, Evie Shockley. I have studied her work like over and over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Adriana? What are some of your people? 
Um, right now, Wendy Trevino uh, is someone whose work I come back to a lot. Um, she has a free PDF of an online chat book called Brazilian is Not a Race. Um, that's really, it's really like, every time people are like, I really love Anzaldua, I'm like, you should read Wendy Trevino's chat book. Um, <clears throat> it's like, it's a very direct, blunt kind of sonnets. Um, she's also a communist, which is something I'm interested in. I think I might be a communist also. So I'm trying to read as much as I can. Um, it just makes sense. I think, I feel like from where I'm at, like politically. Um, so I'm trying to learn more about that. So Wendy Trevino, I feel like is someone who, um, yeah, talks about big things in very concise ways. And I'm also trying to figure out how to do that. Um, I love Ntozaki Shange, Sassafras, Press and Indigo specifically because of like her mix of genres. And I feel like she, along with um, Zero Neil Hurston and Toni Morrison, I feel like do this oh, thing yeah. in their writing where it's like they can become very lyrical, right? And it's like all images. Um, and they can also deliver these really direct and like blunt truths about their experiences. Um, and sometimes, right, even the way that they're describing it is feels very like, it reminds me of the way that my um, my grand, my father's family from um, like East Texas, um, the way that they speak. Um, it sometimes is very plain spoken, but there is an image in there and it's very clear immediately as it's communicated, this person is not trying to hit you over the head with a metaphor, but they're communicating in this very artful way. Um, like my great grandmother, she described daylight savings time once, like when the days started to get darker earlier, she described it as a long, now it's a long time darkness. That's the way she described it. Um, and I feel like when I'm reading their work, like I get that feeling of like, I'm listening to my great granny speak. So I feel like those are, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, they all write in accessible ways that is rooted in like how people actually speak. Because mm -hmm. I, I think that a lot of things for poetry, um, I think in the US, the way that poetry is um, thought about, theorized, um, I've, I've, I've gone to some spaces where people are so invested in language and literally using um, a thesaurus as the right. Um, and for me, one of those things has been like, oh, like I don't want to write with this object telling me what other words I could use because those are not words that are coming to me or the people that I engage with in every day. Um, and before I used to be so invested in language and not anymore. I, I am invested in language, but in a language that I, that me and my family are committed to and have grown in and with and through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, oh, frequency. Hi. Oh my God. Hey, Monday. How are you doing? Oh my gosh, hold on. Frequency, um, I don't know if you remember the first time we ever met, it was in Boston, but I have your chapbook here. <laughs> and it was like maybe five years ago, um, but it's signed too. No, it was over five years ago, I don't know. But look, that was before we like actually like, we're digital friends and stuff. I'm sorry, okay. I'm wondering about navigating the space of being racialized as black within Mexican culture while being light skinned relative to the spectrum of blackness. Yeah, so as one of the things that I think about a lot, um, so one of my first articles that really talked about my blackness um, was on the ways in which my family was really invested in me always having bus cuts because if I had a bus cut, it would be harder for people to understand or to mark me as black. And for them, they were like, oh, um, one of the comments that I grew up with was like, um, el pelo que la gente va a pensar que eres negro, which means cut your hair, otherwise people will think that you're black. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I think that one of my, my hair is such a political um, commitment, particularly because it's like, it reminds me of 
being in grade school and it's always pulling my hair and making comments about my hair, but also um, it's a commitment to like move in my blackness in the most unapologetic way that I can every day uh, because, because I am light skinned and my approximation to colorism and my approximation to the benefits of white supremacy renders light skinned people is incredibly significant. Um, and that's something that I take lightly. Um, I think about my lightness um, and the access of power that it brings me, um, particularly in the U.S. Um, when it comes to me being back home, um, it's very different. Um, back home is very, there's no way that I'm not black back home. Um, and people regularly comment on it. And in, in Oaxaca, the same word you use for black is the same word that people use for sex worker. And be, I don't know if you've noticed, but like I'm kind of feminine. Um, like I was once called a sex worker in the street uh, because I am black. Um, and my racialization works very different in both landscapes. Um, but in the US, I, I do recognize that I move in a very light skinned body um, and that I have a differently black experience than darker skinned folk. Uh, yeah, not even like there's dark skinned folk and there's also like a tad bit darker than me folk and they move through the world in drastically different than I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I just noticed uh, Frequency had an updated version of their question. Are you able to add that Alan? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the clarifying question is, I noticed many light-skinned Afro-Latinx folks talk about their experiences as Black in their home cultures, but not so much about their experiences in Black culture. Um, yeah, I think I can speak to this a little bit. Um, so I feel like one thing that is different uh, about you and I's experiences of Blackness, Alan, is that my Black heritage is from, from the U.S. Um, I mean, it's from West Africa, but like through the U.S., um, and so my, yeah, I grew up with, uh, everyone on my dad's side of the family is much darker than I am. Um, I am as light as I am because my mother is as light as I am. Um, and so I feel like, yeah, when I was growing up, all of my dad's family lived in and still lives in the Houston League City, like Gal Galveston area, which are predominantly black areas. Um, but I grew up in San Antonio, right? So I would spend like summers with my dad's side of the family. Um, so I knew, I never had a question about being black. I always knew that black folk were all were part of the people that I came from. Um, I think it wasn't until high school, um, I started doing sort of like independent black studies on my own, reading as much uh, about black historical figures as I could because I wanted to understand blackness. I needed text to give me like a blueprint for how to do that. Um, and it was through that that I began to, I feel like, begin to understand what is my relationship to other black people, especially black people um, whose blackness is much more visible and much less ambiguous than mine is, um, which I think is a thing that I'm always going to be negotiating and figuring out. Um, but I think it means supporting folks whose blackness is less ambiguous than mine is in any way that in any way that I can. Yeah. Yeah, and um I'll do the the last little bit curious too about darker black folk in your cultures. Yeah. So um El Faisan, which is where uh my mother and grandmother um were born and raised is El Faisan is like dark skinned. Um, and when I went there, I was like, oh <laughs> yeah. So where I grew up in is like, um, I guess like, it's it's so annoying, but the government calls them Afro mestizos. Um, and then El Faisan is like negros. <laughs> so Afro mestizo is this, this identity that I don't identify as Afro mestizo, but the government that's what they identify me as. It's like a mixed race black. Um, my parents are black, so it's interesting how that's like mixed race. Um, but um, in El Faisan, the, the dark sk darker skinned black folk, um, I noticed that their access to jobs back home is like fishing and certain fruit plantations. 
And anything other than those things, they will not get hired because they're dark skin black. Whereas somebody like me, if I lived in that geography, may have may get hired, unsure, but may get hired. Um, and it's it's weird. And also in the US, um, I've met a few black Mexicans in the US who are darker skin than me. Um, and what they have told me is that their darkness um, gives makes Mexicans react in a much worse way than they've reacted to it because for me they're like confused about it and eventually they'll accept but what I've heard from folk who are dark-skinned black Mexicans who I've met in the U.S. is that other Mexican or other Latin American communities just will refuse to even claim them as Latin American or as Mexican whereas because I'm lighter skinned like some Latin American people and some Mexican people will like accept it but that's because of my lightness but when it comes to being darker skinned they're just immediately like the doors are shut yeah. of any potentiality of being part of the community. If I can add a thing to that too. Um, yeah, that made me think about uh, one of my uncles, uh, one of my dad's brothers um, is a dark skinned African-American man uh, living in Houston. And when I told him about some of the topics that I write about, which is a lot about Afro-Mexicanidad, um, he started telling me about one of his coworkers at one of the places he used to work at um, and he sounded super shocked um, that this person he was describing, he described him as being as dark as, as him, as dark as my uncle, but he was from Honduras, right? And this was like a, a very confusing thing for my uncle to meet uh, a black person whose first language was Spanish, right? Um, who had a Spanish name, um, looked like my uncle, but was not African-American. And it was, and I feel like my, my uncle has known me my whole life now, <laughs> right? Uh, this is not the first Afro-Latinx person that, that my uncle has met, but that was still a point of confusion for him um, in a way that it wasn't for, for me. Um, so I think, yeah, I think another thing that I'm thinking about that Frequency's questions are bringing up is just like about the visibility of what Afro-Latinidad sort of looks like. Um, there's a lot of folks who look like you and I, Alan, and not a lot of folks who look like my uncle or the folks that you're talking about who are darker skinned. Um, and that's an issue also, right? Because it means that when people start to think about what blackness looks like in Latin America, they're still picturing someone who is not dark skinned. Yes. <clears throat> and also, there's something about the U.S. media that they have marketed Afro-Latinxes as like light-skinned people. And... Mm -hmm. Like most Afro Latinxes that I have met or that I've encountered in the Americas are not light skinned. But in the US, um, light skinned Afro Latinxes are being uplifted by the masses because they can use our bodies to still mobilize like values of white supremacy and values of colorism. Um, and, and it's also, I think, me as a light skinned black person who has like a platform. I think a lot about that, about the ways in which my platform or my identity or my work is used um, to not think critically about blackness because I am light-skinned. People will be like, oh, well, I jive with that person and they're black, I mean, so I'm not racist, but I'm like, you might jive with me because I'm like significantly light-skinned. Have you thought about that? Like, because yeah. I do notice that whenever I'm on Twitter or on Instagram and I'm like making um, really, charge statements about colorism or anti-blackness people will like support me but when i see like dark-skinned black latin americans make similar statements people will immediately call them like divisive or aggressive or tone policing them and i'm like oh they don't tone police me because i'm light-skinned and they somehow like, feel camaraderie with me because i'm light and they're light mm -hmm. um but those are things i critically think about um when interacting in latin american spaces yeah um yeah and ah, we are. We have two minutes left, Ayana. We said an hour and a half. Anything you want to say or do or? Oh my gosh, uh, does this like automatically gonna cut off in two minutes? No, okay. it's not. Okay. I, was I was like, like oh, am I on a timer? <laughs> um, oh, you're not. You're not. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to add one thing to what you're saying because I feel like um, you and I do a lot of like college uh, shows, right? Like not during right now, obviously, but like. Um, I feel like I get brought out to universities by a lot of like Latinx student orgs or Latinx studies programs. Um, and I feel like often one of the reasons, <laughs> it feels like sometimes when I'm doing poems in these spaces um, or offering workshops or whatever, that they have invited me out um, because I am 
a black person that they feel like, like you said, that they can identify with, right? So like if I read a poem about curanderismo and they're like, oh, I also relate to that. Um, so that means we have something in common and that's why I'm interested in what you have to say. Um, as opposed to when I go into these spaces, which I've started doing in the last year and a half, going into those spaces and reading poems exclusively about blackness because blackness is also a Latinx experience. It's also like a global experience, right? So like me going yeah. into that space and reading and talking about blackness um, is not out of place in a Latinx stu you know, student organization or whatever, but the crickets that are in the room and the way that organizers, like the event organizers have responded to me afterwards have been like, oh, we really enjoyed the workshop, you know, as in like they didn't enjoy the poems or the students really appreciated the workshop, but they couldn't relate to what I was saying in my poems. And I feel like that's fine, right? Like um, my, yeah, but I feel like I've had to be a lot more deliberate about that um, because I feel like when they see me as a light skin person, they're like, oh, this is a, a Mexican who we can sort of like put on the flyers um, and put on our like funding chart, like, um, charts or sheets or whatever and say, oh, we like supported black folks, right? Um, by picking a black person who's like really easily digestible. Um, so I feel like part of being a light-skinned black person in those spaces is like being very intentional about my allegiance to blackness and the fact that I think black power is fun is fundamental, it's foundational. Um, it's not uh, it's not a side thing. So when they get me in that space, it might have <laughs> it might have brought me out because I did dear white girls in my Spanish class. But when I get there, they're gonna hear for the black kids in my Spanish class. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy that this live happened. I literally want to be like, okay, let's do it again next week. <laughs> I, know, I can't believe it's over. Oh my gosh, you want to start a podcast and be millennials? <laughs> I. So a lot of my friends are on podcasts, but I rarely listen to them. Um, but I do, I would love to do this some other time. I mean, both of our birthdays are in like three weeks. Um, so maybe we can have like a birthday celebration uh, or something. I like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so maybe you'll have like a, we'll have like a tourist reading thingy. Um, well, I like that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, oh, so yes, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm gonna drop again the link to Ariana's Sana Sana. So here is the link. Um, here's a link to Sana Sana. Um, and then I'm dropping the link to my chat book to learn more in the age of displacement. Um, the press is based in Oakland and they are shipping uh, during the pandemic. Um, the link is coming and then my full length book, if you want one signed for me, I'll send you that link. Eventually I'll get to ship them. <laughs> I'm sure when, but I will ship them. I do promise you that. Um, give me a sec. I can't add um, comments, Alan, but um, maybe yeah. our um, the cash apps and Venmos for anyone. Who yes. Donate. Can you can you add our cash apps and Venmos? I I cannot. I don't know how to add. Uh, oh, that's so wild. Okay, give me one second. Um, so. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, my computer is being super slow because it's about to die. Um, here's a form to get a signed copy from me, and then Ariana's demo is Ariana dash Brown dash three. What's your cash up, Ariana? Uh, it's just like the dollar sign Ariana the poet. Dollar sign Ariana the poet. Give me one sec. Beautiful, and then um, my Venmo is um, same as all my Insta. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook stuff, Micro and Scribble. Yeah, so please, you know, if you liked it, if you learned something, like if you want to send some money, uh, do it. Um, we are super appreciated. Um, also understand that like, this is a pandemic. <laughs> so, you know, take care of yourself, make sure that you're fed. Um, if you're able to um, get access to stuff, please make sure that you're getting that access. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming and staying through. We had like 160 people at some point, so that was amazing. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, hopefully everything will be report will stay live on YouTube. Um, if you wanna go back to this, just go to my YouTube channel and look for it and it'll be there. So this is literally an archive of Afro-Mexican poetics.
this is one of the coolest things um, I've ever been a part of. So thank you, Alan, for um, like having this idea and also handling all the logistics on how to make it happen. Alan designed the flyer and organized the YouTube Live. Um, so yeah, that's really important work. Thank you for that. And let's do this again sometime. This has been really Absolutely. wonderful. All right, so I'm gonna end it for them. Um, Bye everyone.